How's it going, Tread? Pastor Aaron coming to you tonight from my house, and we're going to be moving on with our next lesson for Tread, and that lesson is going to come to us tonight from Judges chapter 2. So I'm hoping you will have your Bible with you. I hope you will join us with that. As we go through the new book of Judges, we are going to start with what tonight's lesson calls a pattern of rebellion. Now, the word rebellion uh, tonight is going to mean something a little bit different than what my question is going to ask you. And that question is, what are some famous rebellions or movements that you maybe would remember from history class or from history itself? Um, obviously, probably a most common one that people would remember would be the uh, American Revolution and the rebellion against the British government and the rebellion against taxes and the, uh, the different things that the colonists decided to separate themselves from the, um, the country of England. A rebellion in this state and in this instance tonight is something a little bit different as we are talking about a rebellion against God, a rebellion against the things that God has asked us to do or to put in place. And so even though we're talking about a, uh, a rebellion in the sense of what are some movements or changes that we remember from history like the Revolutionary War, tonight is going to be a little more applicable to the fact that we're talking about rebellion in the sense of our sin against God and against God's will. But it is still the idea of this fight or this battle against someone or something else. And so you're going to turn with me to Judges chapter 2, and we're going to begin looking at the nation of Israel and a pattern of rebellion in their lives. So if you would go with me as we talk about our, our opening points today as you're turning to Judges, we're going to be talking about how the fact that God disciplines His people when they turn away from Him and do what is right in their own eyes. That means we as people today, as well as the people that we're going to read about uh, here tonight. The fact of the matter is, is that God does discipline us. And though that we are going to be talking about several different things tonight, the big thing that we're going to be talking about is this idea of God disciplining us when we turn away from Him. But the other thing we're going to be talking about tonight is the doctrine of idolatry. And to give you a little sense of what I'm talking about tonight is this. Uh, the doctrine of idolatry or sin as idolatry is this. Sin is not just a uh, physical act of rebellion against God, such as maybe stealing or lying about something or um, doing something to hurt someone else. It is a matter of our heart. Sin is something deeper than just the act of sin. So for example, when I steal something or when I lie about something or when I uh, gossip or slander or hurt people, um, when I commit sin, there is more to sin than just the act that I'm doing, if that makes sense. To, to give you an example, if I say something hurtful to someone, the sin of gossip and slander are there. But there's a lot more to it than just gossip and slander. It's the condition of my heart. My heart is sinful. My heart is happy to see someone get hurt by my words. My heart is happy that someone else has maybe been offended and I can feel better about myself or just the fact that I'm happy to be a sinner. The fact is sin is more than just a act. It is a condition of our hearts. The physical act of sin is what is coming out of our heart. That comes from Matthew chapter 15 and verses 10 through 20. Scripture tells us that idolatry usually refers to bowing down to some form of statue or structure of gold or wood or some precious metal or stone, creating something to worship rather than the creator God himself. Idolatry can take a lot of forms though, and that's what we're looking at tonight, and that is... Idolatry could be wanting approval from somebody, wanting to be successful or having certain amounts of money, maybe our own desires and pleasures. So sin can take a lot of different uh, faces, if you want to call it that. But as we look at idolatry and we see sin and idolatry in our hearts, we are going to see that the outward act of sin and worshiping something else besides God is more about my heart than the act itself. 
So the, the doctrine of sin and idolatry is what we're looking at tonight. And one of the things to remember is this. When we're talking about idolatry or putting something else in place of God, as Pastor Benjamin has said before, this is something that you will sin to get or sin if you don't get it. Idolatry is everywhere. It is literally all kinds of things around us that can become idols, including our own personal self. It's also very easy. Idolatry is easy, and in the fact that it doesn't really require anything of ourselves because we can do whatever we want. You see, to serve God, it actually means I have to give up myself and follow Him. Idolatry is a lot easier because I can just do whatever I want. And then the last thing is, uh, it's explainable. I can rationalize and, and make arguments for why I do what I do. So idolatry is one of these things that it's hard to it's hard to tell people about and argue and defend against because people see idolatry as something easy and simple and best for me. That's where that heart matter, that broken heart, that sinful heart comes into play. As the, as the Spirit changes our heart, then we can begin to attack and change the sins in our lives. But go with me to Judges chapter 2. We're going to start there today, and we're going to be reading uh, verses uh, 8 all the way up to verses 19. So if you would start with me, we're going to read verses 8 through 13 to start, and we're going to look at the nation of Israel as they begin this new time in their life. So if you look at verse 8, it says that Joshua has died. So read along with me, verse 8. Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years. And they buried him in the, within the boundaries of his inheritance in Timnatha Harris and in the hills of Ephraim, north of the mountains of Gaash. And all the generations who were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the works that he had done for Israel. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served Baal. And they abandoned the Lord and God of their fathers who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. And they went after the other gods for among the gods of the people that were around them. And they bowed down to them and they provoked the Lord to anger. They abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. So let's start tonight with a simple question. What can we do to make sure we do not forget what God has done in the past in our lives. And the reason I ask that question, if you go through these verses and you look at uh, these first couple of verses where Joshua has died, he's 110 years old, and those that were with him, his generation, have died as well. And the first thing that you read down in your verse 10 is, there rose another generation who did not know God. Okay, so the reason I want us to understand what are some things that we need to remember that God has done in our life is because those that did not hear about the things of God grew up not knowing Him. Listen to verse 10 again. It says, And there rose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the works that He had done for Israel. The reason I ask this is because we're talking about a generation of people. Now, we're talking maybe 100, 150 years uh, of, of young people coming up um, between, obviously, Joshua lived to be 110 years old. And so Joshua's generation is over 110 years old, and then there's another generation that comes behind them that obviously has not been taught the things of God. And when we talk about sin, we're talking about the fact that our hearts desire to do something other than obey God. It's a choice. It's a decision. Our, our study says it like this. Walking in obedience and trust is not something a godly leader or anyone else can do for you. It's a choice. And the people of Israel chose to do what was evil. So even though they had a godly leader in Joshua and they had a godly leader in Moses and God's presence was with them, they still chose sin. And that is something that I want to look at. These are not accidents. These are not, uh, oops, I messed up. These are sinful acts by people who desire something other than God. But I also want us to see that the reason that they're really choosing to do what is evil is nobody told them about the things of God. They did not know him and they did not know what he had done. 
So what are you doing to remember what God does for you? What are you doing to remember what God has done throughout history in his word? The next question I have for us is to think of this. What are some things that we're tempted to do? What are some things that we do that we think is right in our own eyes, as the verses say? Well, think of it this way. Choosing to worship other things, choosing to worship gods from the land that they were in, and then turning their back on God is what happened to Israel. But what are some things that we might be doing ourselves, maybe just in a little different way? Are we turning away from God to spend more time on our phones? Are we turning away from Bible study and prayer to spend more time listening to music that is not glorifying to God? Are we turning away from the things of God or staying home from church or staying away from Bible study, staying away from scripture because we would rather do other things? That's a big question for us in the fact that this is a group of people who literally have been led by God to this nation of Israel that he promised them And now a generation, less than maybe 100 to 150 years, people have completely forgot about who God was and what he did. The next thing I want us to do, we're going to slide down to verses 14 and 15, is to look at how has God maybe disciplined us. Read with me, and we're going to read verses 14 and 15, and it says this, So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. He gave them over to plunderers who plundered them, and he sold them into the hands of their surrounding enemies, so that they could no longer withstand their enemies. Whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them for harm. As the Lord had warned, and as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were in terrible distress. When has God disciplined you? Is God disciplining you? Are you listening? That's the question. What has God done to discipline you and how would you respond? Well, as we're talking about this idea of God disciplining you, I want to ask this question. Do you think that God's discipline of you is maybe him losing his his cool, his self-control? He's lost his uh, temper? Or... Is this something that maybe we deserve? Let me read this to you. The Lord has declared in Exodus chapter 34 that he is slow to anger. But there are times where his anger against sin leads to discipline. Let me go back to some of the things that we've already studied this year. And one of those things is the the doctrine of sin and the fact that sin is anything against the holy will of God. Sin is anything that is outside of the nature and the plan of God. So why would God not be angry at us for choosing sin over him? The fact of the matter is, is that God is very long-suffering. And the fact is, we looked at over the last two studies that over 350, almost 400 plus years, nations in the land of Israel were given opportunities to repent, and they did not. And so nation of Israel now comes in and wipes them out. Jericho and the other cities. So what do we do about that? Are we looking at God as someone who's just freaking out? Or is God actually someone that we fear because of who he is and the fact that we have sinned against a holy God? The next question that I would ask is, If he's not losing his cool, how do we respond? How does the nation of Israel respond? Well, it says that they are in terrible distress. They begin to cry out. They begin to cry out. And so we're going to turn over to the last couple of verses, verses 16 through 19. So read with me. And the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hand of those who plundered them. Yet they did not listen to their judges, for they had whored with other gods and bowed down before them. They turned aside from their ways in which their fathers had walked and who obeyed the commandments of God, and they did not do so. Whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hands of their enemies all the days of the judge. And for the Lord was moved to pity by their groanings because of those who were afflicted and oppressed. But whenever the judge died, they turned back and were more corrupt than their fathers, going after other gods, serving them and bowing down before them. They did not drop any of these practices or their stubborn ways. Those are some pretty strong verses to say that 
God actually shows mercy over and over and over again. It says that they did not turn from their stubborn ways. They would sin, rebel, and turn away from God. God would discipline them. They would cry out to God. God would send a judge to save them. And then when the judge would die, they would stop listening to the judge and they would go back to their sin. Pretty horrible cycle, don't you think? So as we look at these verses, the questions we have is this. When has God been showing you love and forgiveness and and mercy even when you're disobedient? You may be going through a situation right now where that is the case. But the most ultimate example of this is the fact that Christ, while we were yet sinners, died for our sins so that we might be saved. That's the ultimate example of this question. But we might be going through a point in our life where we've been sinning against God and God has been patient and loving with us. Even though he might be disciplining us, he's doing it so that he can save us and bring us back. Think about your your family, your life, your friends, the the world around you, and think of some of the idols that we have in place. Now, if I was there on Wednesday nights and we were all together and I asked you what was an idol, most of you guys would start saying things like cell phones and Facebook and movies and money and computer games and friends and relationships and all those things that we've talked about before. And you're right. Some of those things are definitely idols in our lives. Our personal life, our self can be an idol. Money can be an idol. Relationships can be an idol. Um, Acceptance and popularity can be an idol. There's a lot of things that come into this conversation. But what are some things that we can do to address that problem of idols? If we look at Joshua and we look at the people of Israel, Joshua was the leader. And now we have this idea of Joshua has died and the people of Israel are worshiping all kinds of things. In fact, the word that it uses here is to, to cheat on or prostitute themselves with other gods. It's a very powerful word to give us a picture of these are people that have literally uh, cheated on their God. Tonight we're looking at this fact that God does show love and mercy in our lives, even when we don't deserve it, even when we're disobedient. And so tonight we look at this connection. The judges saved people from the consequences of their sin, but they could not change their heart. Christ coming to die for us is the only one that can save us from the consequences of our sins as well as give us his righteousness to create in us a new heart. So I want to close tonight with our questions, and I I want us to to think through these questions. I really want us to think through this story tonight in the fact that even just less than 100 years apart from Joshua dying to a new generation, they turned away from God and did not know him. Question number one, what are some things that you say you believe in, but you struggle to actually live out in your life? I can't answer this question for you, but I'm going to give some examples, maybe even what I would say examples from my own life. We might say that we really love God with all of our heart, but to take time to read the Bible and spend time in prayer, it's a chore. It's difficult, and I'd just rather not do it. I say I'm a God-believing Christian, but you know what? Some of the things that I say with my mouth and, and believe with my heart really have nothing to do with God. It might even be false. I say that I believe in God, I love God, and I will follow God with my whole heart, but I I don't go to church. I don't spend time with God. I don't study God's word. I don't pray to God. Am I struggling to live it out or do I even know him? Question number one, what are some things that you believe but are struggling with to live out in your life? Number two, sin distorts worship. It changes what worship really is. How do we see worship being distracted or directed away from God today? And how can, we, how can we protect against that? So when we talk about worship is distorted, worship is for God. We worship God with our songs, with our readings, with our minds, with our hearts, with our actions. But when we're worshiping something else like an idol, it distorts worship. It takes it away from God and puts it somewhere else. So what are some things in your life, what are some things in my life that are taking away God 
and putting something else in his place. Distorting worship. My last question is this. Parents, if you're watching this, adults, if you come back and watch this later, I want you guys to really think about this question too. Youth group, this question is for me as a father. I have two kids that need to hopefully benefit from my answer to this question. How might things have been different if the previous generation was faithful to discipline their children and to disciple the next generation with them? Think about that. How would it have been different if this generation knew God and knew what God had done? Parents, youth group, adults, that question is for all of us. So as we close tonight, I'm going to close in prayer. I would ask that if you were able to join us tonight, that you would send me any questions you might have about tonight's study or any other question. And if it's something that I can get a video done for for the youth group to answer that question, uh, I will do so this week. If you have other questions, maybe not about tonight's study, but just in the Bible or the Christian life in general, send those to me and we'll go ahead and take care of those. I've also been trying to call and, and touch base with my youth group kids. So if you've not heard from me or uh, you missed a call from me, uh, give me a call back and I will try again this week to touch base with everybody. I hope everybody is doing well and staying safe. Would you bow with me? Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight to answer the question, what is the idols that may be in our life? What are the things that we have allowed to take you out of the middle and replace you with other things? Lord, we answer that question, hopefully, with the intent of battling against those idols and removing those idols from our lives so that we may seek and follow you. Lord, help us not to be like those that are of the nation of Israel, where we are a pattern of rebellion against you. Lord, I pray for wisdom and strength for all of those watching and those that are learning from these studies as we study together the things that you have done throughout Scripture. And we thank you and we praise you for the death of your Son who brings us the mercy and the grace that we did not deserve to be saved from the sin that we so constantly struggle with. We pray for your wisdom, we pray for your strength, and we pray for your safety. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Hope you will join us next week and have a great night.